Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful God we serve. What a wonderful God we have to uh, walk with. He's a wonder-working God. He's a miracle-working God. <clears throat> we can believe God for miracles. We can believe God for good things to happen in our lives because He's a good God and He doesn't have anything bad to give us. And if you're a child of God, you need to re always realize that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. We've been chosen, brought out of darkness for a specific purpose that you may be praises unto him. I think we should read that scripture from the book of First Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9. First Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9. But you are a chosen generation. You're a chosen generation. So out of all the generations, you have been a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood walking in kingdom authority and holiness. That's what it simply means. You walk in kingdom authority and holiness. That's an honor to understand who royal priesthood are. And a holy nation, we are a nation put together. All, all children of God put together, we are a nation. A, a peculiar people. A different kind of people. Your approach to people and you do things so differently. So there is no surprise. Or in other words, you're a, you're a purchased property. You're a purchased people. You have been purchased, a peculiar people, a peculiar people that you should show forth praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I mean, we have a lot, lot, lot we can meditate on the scripture. And we are a peculiar people, a people that should show forth praises. There should be always praises coming out of our mouth. We are, we are created for praises unto him who has called us out of darkness. We were in darkness and he has called us into his marvelous light. That's where the kingdom is. That's where everything good that is. God is light and he has brought us out of darkness, out of sheer misery. He has brought us into the land of the promises that are made available for us. So we are a chosen people. When you act differently, talk differently, live differently, believe differently, don't be surprised. As you keep growing, you'll start seeing yourself so different. As you keep growing in the Lord, you will start seeing your, your reactions are different. Your, 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 you, you react differently to situations, to to people, to, to the surroundings, to the present happenings. You, you are different. You don't, you don't panic like everybody else. You don't just let things come over you and, and arrest your thoughts and make you feel, my God, I'm going to be the next. People have been laid off and I'm going to be the next. No, you are not going to be. You're going to be, the, you're going to be promoted next. Always remember when you're walking with God, you're going to be always in a position uh, uh, that you can, you can believe God who is for you and he is not against you. He's not against you by any reason. He's not against you by any reason. He is for you. If you understand that he is for you and he is not against you, then you will say, I'm going to, I'm going to trust him and I'm going to walk in this uh, uh, beautiful journey of faith that he has prepared for me. I'm going to run this race with patience, laying aside all weights and the sin that easily besets us, looking unto Jesus who is the author and the finisher of my faith. I'm looking unto him and I'm just walking. I'm so blind to the world and I'm so, so open to looking unto Jesus. That was a beautiful song we used to sing those days and, and, and we do sing here also where it says, uh, looking at Jesus and the things around us get strangely dim. Looking unto Jesus, I mean, when I look into his holiness and the things around me strangely becomes dim. 
and things around should be dim in your life because you, you should be walking in the brightness uh, in the kingdom of God. So you are a chosen, a peculiar people, a royal priesthood called out of darkness to his marvelous light that you might be people of praise. See, every time we have a praise, the word hallelujah simply means in Hebrew, praise the Lord. That's what it simply means, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm just praising the Lord all the time. I'm just praising the Lord all the time. Praise is, is, is to, praise is, is your, you're just talking high about him. You're magnifying him. See, when you, when, you, when you magnify the Lord, things around you get strangely dim. The values that you had for certain things become of no, hardly any value for you. Making a decision for God should be a norm in a child of God, for a child of God. And it might be costly in the eyes of the world. You might have to give up something to, to, to do his will sometimes. But then it, you would feel, my, it's, it's far greater for me to do what the will of the Lord is for my life than to just enjoy the temporary sins that the world offers me. You know, the Bible talks about a man called Moses he was brought up in a palace and nobody knew that he was the one, he was a Jew and he was somebody who was not, in, not knowing their culture and the kind of things. He was brought up and when, it came, when he came of age in Hebrews chapter 11, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 23, by faith... When you come to know Jesus, Lord of your life, by faith you start doing things. Not seeing the end results through your human eyes, but by faith you make a decision believing what he has promised you. you know, sometimes to make a decision to live godly, it might cost you. It will cost you something. But that cost is immaterial. It, it, it's, it's nothing compared to what he will do for you. Many years back, I had a situation, many, many, many years back, almost over 30 years, I suppose, and I was supposed to, I mean, the temptation that came to me at that time, and, and it, the, the temptation was getting stronger and stronger, and I was thinking, oh my God, I might fall into this sin. It's going to definitely... It's arresting my thoughts and it's, it's catching up with me. And, and one night, uh, the Lord just showed me this scripture. Let me, come back to, uh, let me come back to this Hebrews. Before that, I'll, let me show you this scripture from the book of Romans. Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter 8. And uh, so I really was almost, I was almost falling into this because in my thoughts almost now. I was almost giving into it. And the Lord opened this scripture to me from the book of Romans chapter 8 and verse number 18. Romans 8 and verse number 18. And the Lord said to me, For I consider, or I reckon, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So I made this my personal I made the, every scripture has to come out, it's written in general, but then it can turn out to be, you can turn that out to be a personal revelation to you. Romans 8 and verse 18, for I reckon that the suffering of this present time, or this tem temptation that was very strongly coming into my life, which I was almost about to give into, and the Lord spoke to me and said, I mean, you got to suffer this thing. You got to let go of it. Don't let it give you a temporal pleasure and make you feel that you're, you have achieved something in life. Suffer that thing. And I reckon that the suffering of this present time or maybe something that you are going through today, maybe a situation that you're going through and you're about to make a decision and you know that it's not, a, it's not the right decision, it's not a, not a good decision. And it is, it is destructive, knowing even in the natural. But then sometimes we, we, we surpass, we just, we just want to, we just feel it's good, it's not bad after all. 
I want to make this decision. But then the Lord said to me, uh, to I reckon that oh, I, I reckon the, uh, the suffering of this present time that you uh, are not worthy to be compared. It's not worthy to be compared for what God is about to do in your life. You're not, it's not even worthy. You can't even, it's not worthy to be even compared for the glory that shall be revealed in, uh, in me. I said, Lord, I thank you for speaking to me and that word just got into my heart and I got some strength and I started rejoicing. I said, thank you, Lord, you're, you're, you, you, you care for me so much. I was all, almost about to slip into something that I should have not even thought about. And uh, I, I rejoiced and, I, and some of, there was so much joy in me. I said, Lord, I thank you for the, I won't even compare. I won't even talk about this. I won't even think about this thing. I'm going to refuse it, and I refuse it totally. And I said, I have nothing to do with this. And then I, I overcame. Not that I got into the act of it, but I still overcame in my mind. You've got to overcome things in your mind first. You might sometimes say, I'll, I'll overcome when it comes, when, when I really face a situation. But if you don't overcome in your mind, when the situation arises, then you're definitely going to fall into it. You've got to be an overcomer in your mind. You've got to overcome and let the Holy Spirit talk to you and to overcome things in your mind. It's a bat your battlefield is the mind. The battlefield is the mind. The devil is strongly working in your mind. Your flesh and your emotions are being stirred up and then the Holy Spirit is talking to you and say, it's not worth. It's not worth for what you're about to do. It's not worthy at all. It's not worth at all. It, it cannot be even compared to what I'm going to do in your life. The plans that I have for your life. The things that I have, I have desired for you to have in your life. It can be some of the decisions that you make in your life can be costly in the world's way. Looking, looking at the world and you would think, my, I'm just missing out something. It might be costly, but still you make it because the Holy Spirit tells you. You, do, you, you. you make the decision because the Holy Spirit is guiding you in this situation. You do this because the Holy Spirit is protecting you from making the bad decision in your life. And when I came out of it, I said, Lord, I thank you that I didn't have to get into this mess all mess around me and I didn't have to just clean up the mess later and say, come to you weeping and crying and saying, oh God, forgive me. So you can, you can, you can, you can relieve yourself from all that if you take some wisdom, if you, if you make some decisions in your life because you can make godly decisions in life. You can make it. Don't put the blame on somebody else or don't put the blame on the pressure. Don't say it's peer pressure after all. You know, we have these fancy terms that we try to bring in, but go to the scripture which is so simple to understand. He would tell you how you could overcome. Many people, they just use the fancy terms just because the world uses those terms. And we kind of think, oh, I'm distressed, I'm stressed out, and I'm, I feel depressed. Why don't you stop all that and say, I thank you, Lord, that you have given me the strength and the courage and the boldness to overcome the situation. I'm strong. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. And you, you can live differently. You can talk differently. And you can change your surrounding by your own words. Words that come out of your mouth. You can drive away the evil force out of your words. Did you know that there's a miracle in your mouth? Did you know that there's authority in your words? Did you know that there's so much of power in your mind? that you can store God's word in, 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 in great numbers. And you can all the time say, God, I can just flow. My mind can flow in God's word. So uh, I, I decided and I overcame that situation. Let me take you to another scripture from the book of Psalm. Psalm and uh, chapter number 17, Psalm chapter number 17 and verse number 4. Psalm 17 and verse 4. Concerning the works of man or concerning the purposes and the works of men, by the word of thy lips, by the word of thy lips, God has lips. 
he has, I mean, if you read the whole book from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, he is a person. He has a head, mouth, lips, uh, uh, hands, feet, because when you look at man, we are made in the similitude of God. We're just made as man. God made man in his own image and in his own likeness. He's not a monster. If you ever thought about God, I'm going to see a monster. No, you're, 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 you're not talking about a monster. E- even angelic beings are fierce. That's why every time an angel came to a person, fear not. Every time people had to, people, had, people got scared by looking. But if you look at God, he's, he's just, Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Of course, he was talking about his character, but more than that, also, I mean, Jesus, he's not a monster. God is not a monster. When you see him, don't be surprised by looking at God and say, oh my God, I thought he was a very strong being. He's very strong and he's full of love and full of life and full of light. But he's not a monster, definitely not. You couldn't fellowship with a monster. God made man for the sole purpose of fellowship. He wanted a family. And that's why you and I are made in his own image and his own likeness. And the greatest damage that the devil did in the Garden of Eden was to remove the image of man. Tear down the image of man and just make him a mere fallen creature. But Jesus, on the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he overcame the devil. He died on the cross for us and bringing that image back to man, making you just as he is, just as he is. So concerning the works of men, by the word of thy lips, by the words of God's, uh, by, by the word of God's, uh, by the words that come out of God's mouth, I have kept me from the path, paths of the destroyer. Satan has a lot of pathways that he has prepared and planned for you. If I get him this way, okay, if I can't get him this way, I'll get him this way. If I can't get him this way, I'll do it. He'll come with a bag of tricks and he would, he had many paths. He would show you many things, but God has only one way out for you and that's called the way of escape. In every temptation, you always have a way of escape. In the book of 1 Corinthians, third chapter 10 and verse number 13, God says, temptations come to all. Temptation is common to all. There is no temptation that has taken you, but as such as, uh, as is common to man. Temptations come to all. But God is faithful. Because you're a lover of God, God says, I'm faithful to you. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above or above that you can bear. He's not, he, there is no temptation in this world. Now, remember one thing, God is not the tempter. The devil is. The things of the world is. The people around who are demonized, they can be the ones who can tempt you. Right? Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able to bear. So he says, there is no temptation that you, can over, you can't overcome. Any situation you can overcome. You, do, you don't have to say, oh my God, this peer pressure. Oh my God, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't understand. You know, those are all excuses we make because we have decided to do something. But when God talks to you, he says, there is no temptation that, you, that, is, that is common to man. And there is no temptation taken you which is uh, such, is, uh, such as uh, is common to man. But God says, I am faithful. The faithful one is talking to you. And he says, you will not be tempted beyond what you can bear. But with every temptation, when the devil comes with different various, you know, he comes with a bag of tricks with various things. And God says, in, in the time of temptation, I will make a way of escape for you. I will make a way of escape that you will be able to bear it. You always have escape method. It's not that God wants you to be afraid of demons, but he says, simply take this pathway. 
when you're, when you're really uptight and when you're so troubled with, you know, I've got to do this, I've got to do this. God says, okay, in the midst of all the trouble, keep it cool. Go this way. You're safe. Oh, I don't know. Go this way. And, you're, and you will hear the voice of God. You can train yourself to hear the voice of God. Don't you ever believe when people say it's hard to hear the voice of God. If you call yourself a sheep, you are, you are a candidate, perfect candidate to hear his voice because he's your shepherd. In John chapter 10 and verse 27, it says, I am your shepherd and you are my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. When people say it's hard to hear the voice of God, sometimes preachers make it complicated for people to sometimes think, oh, these are deep things, see, everybody don't understand. No, there's nothing too deep that you can't understand. The Holy Spirit is the deepest one who's already come inside of you. And the Bible says, deep calleth unto deep. Anything that is deep of God, the Holy Spirit is already inside of you and he can reveal things to you. Don't you call yourself a dumb person. I'm a Christian, dumb person. I can't hear the voice of God. I, I find it so difficult. No, that's being foolish. You, you can be born again today and from this moment onward, you'll be able to hear his voice. Yeah, that's how it is. You will start hearing his voice. And sometimes I have seen babes hear the voice of God even quicker than somebody who has been in the Lord for 20, 30 years. They find it so difficult to hear because they, they took it as, well, it's after all, I mean, the same sermon, the same word. I mean, I got to just read. You know, when you make things routine, you call it a routine thing. I mean, it's just a routine after all. God is not a God of routine. He's a fresh, he's, he's a... His mercies are new every morning. When you wake up in the morning, oh my God, it's a new morning today. Yesterday is gone, but today is a renewed morning. Something that is so refreshed. I love this scripture. I'd like to read it to you uh, from the book of Lamentations, chapter 3. The book after Jeremiah. The book of Lamentations. I love the scripture. In Lamentations chapter 3 and verse number 22 onwards, it is, the, it is of the Lord's mercies that, that we are not consumed or destroyed because his compassions fail not. God's compassions don't fail. And then it says the Lord, verse number 23, they are new. His compassions are new every morning. You can start a new day. Every morning you can say, God, you're not a God just of, uh, of the days gone by, but you're so fresh and new every day. They are new every morning. God's compassions are new every morning. God's compassion, I mean, it's more than words. It's action. See, God, the Bible says, Jesus was moved with compassion and he healed the sick. Or you would say, the action part of God is his compassion. The action part of God, God is, he's compassionate and his compassions are new every day. Morning, every morning, every morning they're new. I can say, Lord, I thank you that your mercies are new every morning. Every morning. And uh, great is thy faithfulness. That's how good the Lord is to us. That's the reason we fellowship with him. That's the reason we read the Bible. That's the reason not to get some brownie points, but simply because I have a relationship with him. And I have put this relationship into a fellowship. I'm, I'm not somebody. God is not somebody who doesn't speak to you. He's a talking God. He's a speaking God. You mean, if, you, if you say that he's not speaking, read the Bible. And you will know in how many places he has spoken to you. Just go through some of the markings that you've had in your, 
older Bibles. Some of you have had some older Bibles. Now, I personally, this might be the seventh or the eighth Bible or something. But if I go through my old Bibles, every time I put a date, a mark, I say, God, you spoke to me. And I can never say that God never spoke to me. He always spoke to me. He's a talking God. He's a communicating God. He's not somebody who is dumb or deaf. He said, my hands are not short that I can't answer you, that I can't move towards, uh, for you. Am I not, I'm not deaf. I'm not dumb. God himself says in the Bible in several places. He's a communicating God. He talks to us. He loves us. He loves to communicate with us. So, so, so think, think, when you think about God, he's all fresh. Every morning he's new. I wake up in the morning, I say, oh, thank you for another beautiful day, Lord. I messed up last night, Lord. I messed up. But I thank you, Lord. Your compassions are new every morning. I, I, I thank you, Father. I, I don't have that, that weakness mentality. I mean, none of us should ever be having that poor image of, you know, being weak. I mean, some people have this inferiority complexion about themselves and they feel that, you know, I'm just a nobody. Well, you are everybody. You are everything to God. That's why he paid the price for you. He paid the highest price that heaven could offer and purchased you. You're a purchased property. He paid not just, I mean, we would highly value the things like, you know, uh, gold and silver. And God says, none of those things are even worthy to be compared to the price that I paid to purchase you. It's only for this world, the short period that we live. The Bible talks, let's go to that scripture from the book of First Peter chapter 2, chapter 1, and verse number 18. First Peter chapter number 1, And verse 18, for as much as you know, for as much as you know that you are not purchased, you were not redeemed or purchased or or loosened with corruptible things such as, God says, such as silver and gold. In the eyes of God, silver and gold is corruptible things such as silver and gold. I mean, he says, for as much as you know, you were not redeemed or you were not let loose from your sin and your bondage with corruptible things such as or as silver and gold. And God looks at silver and gold and says, it's corruptible things. Streaks in heaven are made out of solid gold. Streaks in heaven are made out of solid gold. And, and, and one pearl, think of one huge pearl, and you find the gates to the kingdom of God or, or to his presence. One is made out of one huge pearl. So God says, these are corruptible things. Or from your vain conversation received by your traditions from your heart, you were not redeemed by the vain conversations I mean, people have all kinds of sayings, see good, be good, do good. I mean, after all, we have to live in this world. I mean, we are dying and then we don't take anything away and all those things are good. You know, they take from the Bible here and there and they talk. But then eventually, they would even, would, would want you to believe those traditional teachings which are worthless eventually, worthless because you can only be redeemed by the incorruptible seed of God's word and his blood. You can be only saved, forgiven by his blood only. And then it says, verse 18, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible uh, things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot, without blemishes or without blames, uh, without blemish and spot. So you are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. The blood of Christ was a price that was paid to redeem you and me 
from the curse. That's the reason you call yourself a blessing. You're redeemed from the curse. From the curse. There is no curse hanging on you. I'm afraid if there's a generational curse. I'm afraid if, if somebody can cast a spell on me. I mean, I'm a curse. No, you're a blessed person. One of the meanings of the word blessed means you have the power to prosper in life. You have the power to speak words over your life and prosper. Everything that you do, everything that you do, and everything that you say out of your mouth, you're speaking a blessing. You have life in you that you can speak over your own life. So you keep yourself from the parts of the destroyer by the words that come out of his lips. God speaks to you. Remember one thing, God always talks to you before you fall into a rut. He'll help you out and he would, I mean sometimes we fall into it and then we repent and we come back but I would rather choose not to go through the school of the hard knocks. I would like to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Some people, they just, they just, I mean, they're just, just so used to it. I just love to go to the school of the hard knocks. If you want it that way, but I don't prefer it that way. Don't have to repent later. But if I can repent now and say, God, I'm going to change my decision. This is what I was thinking about. This is what I was thinking that I should do now, but I'm going to change. I'm going to change. And I'm going to say, Lord, um, help me. Talk to me. I'm going to make my decisions right. So let's go back to the book of uh, Hebrews. Hebrews, which I wanted to talk to you about Moses. By faith, whenever you, you, you verse number 23, in uh, Hebrews 11 and verse 23, whenever you see the word faith, you can always put yourself there saying, I live by faith. Because I'm a just man and I live by faith. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid for three months of his parents because the command was that kill all babies who are boys. And that was a command that was given by the king. But the mother of Moses, she protected this child and kept this child. Because they saw that this child was a proper child. I don't know how they saw it because I believe strongly that God wanted to protect this child for a purpose. But they were not afraid of the king's commandment. The king's command was every male child to be killed. Every male child to be killed. For the sole reason because the Israelites were flourishing children were born and they were enjoying everything but the Egyptians were dying and this is a plan of the devil and this is exactly what the devil wants to do even in the world today to destroy children don't bring them up destroy them and they were not afraid of the king's command and the next verse by faith Moses when he was when he was come to years or when he came to understanding, he refused to be called the son of the Pharaoh's daughter. He refused. There are some things that you must refuse in life for you to receive from God. Sometimes we don't refuse certain things. That's why we don't receive from God. There are certain things that you've got to reject and refuse and say, God... I refuse it. I know my conscience tells me, I got the voice of the conscience that is the voice of my spirit, which tells me that I shouldn't do this, that I should not get involved with this, that I should keep myself away from this. You got to come to the place where you refuse certain things, and then you're able to receive certain things from God. When God gives you something also because of your refusal to what you're supposed to be Refusing, God cannot even put that into your heart. God cannot even speak to you. Even if he has wisdom that he has for you concerning your future, he finds it difficult to put it across to you because 
you refused to do certain things. I refuse. I don't want to. I, I think I'm right. Verse number 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Sin is only a pleasure for a season. Sin is only a pleasure for the season. Now you can always know, you can always weigh sin by your own spirit, not by what you think in your mind. That's why the Bible says, trust in the Lord for wisdom and lean not unto your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. And he, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. It's very seasonal. And eventually it's destructive. That's the reason we got to say, okay, I refuse. Because what you refuse, which is, which God wants you to refuse, eventually you will find, you will be able to receive something that Christ has for you. See, the next verse tells us, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches. Now, where was Christ? We didn't even heard the word Christ in the Old Testament, but he, but the word Christ simply means anointed one. Jesus was very much alive in the times of Moses. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. You might have to, you might, it, it might be a little costly for you to refuse something. He had treasures in Egypt. He refused to do the will of God. He refused the treasures for he had respect. Let me tell you one thing. When you have respect for the rewards that God has for you, you're a changed person. When you have respect for the rewards that God has for you, and if you don't have any respect for the rewards that God has for you and you just run into something that is, you know, a temporal pleasure that kind of keeps you okay for a while, you're missing out on the, on the real blessings. For he, Moses, had respect unto the recompense of reward. He had res- you better respect some rewards that you're going to get. This life is rewarding. This life is rewarding. To obey his voice is rewarding. To walk with God is, is, is rewarding. And rewards don't come to people who don't refuse. You got to refuse and esteem or you got to respect the rewards that God has for you. I, res- I refuse to what the devil offers me, what the world tries to offer me. You can make your own decision. Nobody needs to push you into making decisions. It's when you give yourself into something that you know that God doesn't want you to and then you want to be around it and fall into the temptation. See, if you're not around, around it, you don't fall into it. Only if you're around it, you fall into it. Run from it. The Bible says, flee, youthful lust, flee. Flee, it says in the book of Timothy. Timothy chapter number, okay, we'll read Second Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 22. Flee youthful lusts. Flee, run away, run away. Flee youthful lusts. You know, Joseph had to run away from Potiphar's wife because he was a young looking, nice person. I mean, he was a young, nice looking person and Potiphar's wife all of a sudden cast her eyes on him and said, you lie with me. And he refused. It was costly for him to refuse. He ended up in jail. It was costly, but he refused. I like that scripture. Let's go to that scripture quickly. To the book of Genesis. To the book of Genesis. And eventually, that refusal brought him to be second in command under Pharaoh. 
He was the top guy. He turned out to be the top guy because he refused to compromise. He refused to compromise. In Genesis chapter 39 and verse number 8, here we see another, you see the same word here. Well, verse 7 onwards. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and she said, Lie with me. What did he do? Did he go in for it? Oh, it's a good deal after all. Uh, the master's wife, I mean, I'm in charge of everything here. I mean, after all, the master's wife is the only one who, whom I'm not in charge of. I mean, now she is coming under my charge. That's a good deal. I got the whole, I mean, whatever the master has, I've already got. No, he didn't do that. What did he say? But he refused. That's a good word there. I like the word refuse. I like the word refuse because I have, in my life I have refused a lot of things and I found myself to come out and enjoy the greater blessings that he has for me. Many times. I mean, if I were to I mean, have, have I, it, it would take time for me to just talk about the things that I refused. And I'm still enjoying all what God has for me. Joseph refused and said unto, said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master watered or has handed over not what is with me in this house, but he had committed all things, uh, committed all that he had in, into my hand. Everything has been provided for me and handed over. Take care of everything. There is none greater in this house than I. The next verse. There is none greater than I in this house. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee. Because thou art his wife, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Where is God here? God is not to be even seen. Nobody can see God here. He, can, he could have even thought, okay, God, you'll always pardon me. It's all right after all. But he refused. I like the word refuse. Learn. I mean, if you learn something today, just take the word refuse and receive from God. Refuse what the devil says and receive what God has for you. How then can I do this wickedness, this great wickedness? I mean, to lie down with a woman sometime today, it's, I mean, see, it's not a great wickedness. It's after all, a, I mean, accepted thing after all. I mean, we are living in this world. Somebody, when I say, when I use the word adultery, I mean, he was, he was, he knew what I meant. But he said, so what's adultery for you? What's adultery? I said, it's just going to somebody who does not belong to you if you're a married person. So what about it? Is it such, such a great sin? But this man, he knew that he had, he had, God had a plan for his life. And he refused something and he received something from God. He refused to lie down with her. There can be no, I mean, this is a great wickedness. A betrayal to my master to go with my master's wife. And then she made a story and, and eventually he ended up in jail. The husband believed her. The story that she made was that he forced on me. He forced on me and then look, I got his garments. He ran away left, leaving his garments behind. That was the evidence that the husband believed. And that's how, the, how wicked somebody can be to you. And how would you want to lie down with the person who is so wicked? It's good for us to walk in the ways of the Lord and, I mean, and, and to understand that God has a greater plan for us. I don't know why I'm going so deep into this because God has some good things for you in store and, and, and you, you, you despise it by just running into something that is so cheap and unworthy and no good. Looks good for the moment. But it's, a, it's something that needs to be counted as refuse. That junk, that's junk. 
That's junk. I don't want to, I don't want to even have nothing to do with it. It's, it's, it's against my conscience. How can I do this great sin, great wickedness against God? I want to live the life that God wants me to live. I respect the rewards that he gives me. Respect the rewards that he gives me. I, I choose to walk, I choose to walk in victory than to walk in defeat. I choose to walk in health than to be sick. I choose to walk in peace than to be living in confusion. I choose to walk in holiness than to walk in un, unholiness. I choose to enjoy the, the promises of God than to believe the lies of the devil. I choose something. You've got to choose something and refuse something and enjoy the benefits that God has for you because you're a chosen person, a royal priesthood, a peculiar person. You're called out of darkness into, your, into his marvelous light. You're not, somebody who, you're not somebody who can be just kicked around and used by the devil or by the circumstances around or by the demonized people. Your yes is a yes and a no is a no. You're settled all together in your heart that I wouldn't even consider doing or even thinking or planning of getting involved with something that the devil has for me. See, the devil has, he has, you know, that scripture, we should read that scripture again. Go with me to Proverbs chapter, uh, Psalm 17 and verse 4, where it says, Concerning the works of men, by the word of thy lips, I have kept myself in the paths. The devil has several paths. He shows you things that are very attractive. And it's only by the word of God that comes out of the lips of God. God speaks. He's a God who speaks. There is a written word and there's a spoken word. There's a written word which tells you that has drawn the plan for you and, 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 and the principles are laid down. But there are times that you don't have, you're not carrying the Bible, but you, you have the Spirit of God in you. And he speaks to you. He opens his lips and speaks to you to keep you from the paths of the destroyer. That devil wants to destroy you and make you sick. And if you believe his pathway and you start, you start getting afraid and saying, oh, I'm afraid if I would catch this cold. I'm afraid if I catch this flu. I'm afraid. You don't have to catch nothing of the devil. You have to simply walk in, in, in victory by saying, I'm not going to catch nothing of the devil. I'm going to walk in divine health. It's my choice. It's a choice that I make. You, know, you, you, got to, you got to be determined. People of faith are not, you know, who live loosely and say anything goes all right after all, I have faith in my heart. Yeah, that is ultimate faith for us to be in heaven. But what about living a victorious life here on earth? When God says, I have redeemed you from the curse of the law. There's a curse that was upon the law. And God has redeemed you from that curse. Hang on to the blessing and refuse the curse because Jesus became a curse for us so that the blessing of God might come upon your life. Let me show you just to encourage you with the current situation and people just are so hanging around with things and go with me to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse number 59. 59 and 60. Or, and 61. Then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful. Now when you see the word the Lord will make thy plagues, you got to understand that in the permissive sense, it simply means God shall permit. God will not do it for you. God permits. Then the Lord shall permit thy plagues wonderful and plagues of thy seed, and great plagues, and long continuance of so sicknesses, and long 
continuance. It's talking about sickness that can continue to keep prolonging in your life long years. Oh, I have been suffering with this for the last 25 years. God says, put an end to it now. Stop being afraid and receive the word of God. When you partake in the communion, believe that you can be healed now. Jesus carried your sicknesses and diseases so that you can be healed. Long continuing diseases, sicknesses, and you kind of think, well, it's all right. Now, when you read these scriptures, always put this scripture in line with Galatians 3.13. Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Right? Put the scripture up and then we'll come back to this. Curse, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now what we read was, that was under the law, which was a curse. Continual diseases, sicknesses. Christ has redeemed us from the law. Curse of the law. Not from the law really. The law is spiritual, the Bible says. The law is good. But Christ died for us so that he can, he can destroy the curse that was to come upon our life. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, curse is everyone that hangs on the tree. So Christ has redeemed you or made you free or delivered you. He became the ransom to redeem you from the curse of the law. So the scripture that we read in 59 is a curse to live under this curse. I don't want to live under this curse. I want to be blessed. So I'm taking this scripture and I'm applying it to my life and saying, I'm blessed from long continual diseases, sicknesses. I'm going to continue walking in divine health. The next scripture, moreover, he will bring once again, he would permit, it's all in the permissive sense, he will permit to bring upon all diseases of Egypt, the word Egypt simply needs to be understand those who reject Christ. Those who reject Christ, right? Egypt does not, is not talking about the country Egypt or, or the nation of Egypt. It's talking about understanding it spiritually. It's talking about those who, were, who had no covenant with God. Moreover, he will bring upon the, all the diseases of Egypt. There are many diseases of Egypt. People in the world are suffering with many diseases. Better start getting used to it because you better start getting used to something that is very important, your covenant with God because things are going to get worse. I mean, everybody say, oh my God, if we are, we are cleansed from this, it'll be good. But remember one thing, things are closing up. The devil is so mad, he knows that his time is too short. He's trying to, he's mad. You know, a, a mad dog, what he would do, anything that comes close to him, he would just bite. But he couldn't come close to you because you have a covenant with God. You better remember that you have a covenant with God. Don't you just get uh, stung by the serpent or don't you ever. The Bible says you shall tread on serpents and scorpions. You shall tread on, tread on them, not just let them sting you. All the diseases which thou was afraid of. We were afraid of some of the diseases. And they shall cleave unto you. Once again you bring back Galatians 3.13 and says, I'm redeemed from this, the curses or the diseases of Egypt or the world. I'm redeemed from that. Right? And none of those things are going to cleave unto me. None of those things are going to cleave unto me. None of those diseases are going to cleave unto me. I'm redeemed from that curse. I have, a, I have a shield around me of protection. I have the blessing of Abraham. The Bible says in verse 14, it says that the blessing of Abraham might come upon me. That the blessing, what is the basic blessing of Abraham? Number one, everybody thinks it's all prosperity. That's true. But number one, we find the blessing of Abraham is the shield of protection. The blessing of Abraham is fear not. In Genesis 15 and verse number one, he says to Abraham, he appeared to Abraham in a, in, a, in a vision through his word. And he said, after these things, the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision saying, fear not. Number one blessing of Abraham is 
you don't have to live in fear for God has not given you a spirit of fear. God has not given you a spirit of fear. Don't be afraid all the time being afraid. If you listen to bad news, you're definitely going to be afraid. And the second blessing is, I am your shield. Nothing can penetrate through a shield. And God says, I personally, I'm your shield. None, do you think any disease or any sickness can penetrate through God into your life? Because we don't take this word literally, we just take it as, oh yeah, there is a scripture called God is my shield. No, he literally says, I am standing before you as a shield of protection. And when you start talking bad about yourself, I wonder if I'm going to be the next to catch with this, this uh, fatal disease. Why do you want to even think of it when God says, I'm your shield? That thing has to penetrate through God. And the next blessing we have is, I'm your exceeding great reward. I'm your reward. Exceeding great reward. That includes everything that life requires. Keep you away from everything that is troubling you. So, you're redeemed from that curse. Finally, we are going to read Deuteronomy 28 and verse 61. Also, every disease, I'm sorry, every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this law, then will the Lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed. Well, permissive sense, once again, God permitted it to come upon because they disobeyed the law. But Christ has redeemed you from the curse of the law. You're redeemed from the curse of the law. From every plague which is not even written in this book of the law, which means, I mean, there are some diseases that are mentioned. You can read, the, as you read the curse of the law, you can read, which is from verse 15 to 68. You can read all those, but then some of the names that we go through today, some of the names of diseases that we face today, God says he has also redeemed you from those. You must say, I'm looking for this word. I mean, sickness is rampant all over, and they're talking high about this. Whatever name they talk about, the name of Jesus is above every other name. And any sickness that is not even written or disease that is not in the book of the law, the Lord has redeemed you from it. The Lord has redeemed you. So fear not. God has not given you a spirit of fear that you should fear. Make the right choice in life. Stand your ground and say, devil, I'm a child of God. I'm a chosen generation. I'm a royal priesthood. I'm a holy nation. I don't belong to the devil where the devil can just play around with me. I'm not a, I'm not a toy of the devil. I'm a son of God. Where the devil can play around. You know, some, some Christians, I mean, they just let the devil just run around there. You know, in one scripture it says in Isaiah, I'll read to you sometime later, uh, in 50 something, where it says, Satan wants to use you like a rug. He says, bow down and I'm going to walk over you. I want to use you like a rug. But you've got to turn that around and say, devil, you're going to be far below my feet. You cannot, you cannot put me down. You cannot put me down. You're going to be under me. When I read that scripture, I said, God, I thank you. The devil wants to use me like a rug? Oh, no way. I'm not going to let the devil use me as a rug. I'm going to walk over him. I'm going to walk over him. You shall tread on serpents and scorpions, diseases and sicknesses you shall tread upon. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Don't walk in fear, walk in faith. When God called you, the very first thing he called you out is to walk by faith. He said, the day, the just, when you become a just, how do I become a just? By believing Jesus, Lord of my life. I become a just, and who is a just? A righteous person. A person who is clean as ever, and in the eyes of God, there is nothing behind. God doesn't see anything of what your past, 
The only thing he knows that you're a pastor, you were a sinner, but now you're a righteous man. So he doesn't see your sin. That's your background. And he looks at you and says, you're the righteousness of God. And if you're the righteousness of God, and the way that a righteous man lives is by faith, not in fear, not through your emotions, but you live by faith. And faith only comes by the word of God. Faith does not come by hearing the world's news. Faith does not come by everybody saying almost the same thing and we believe that report. No. If you trust in the Lord, your heart is fixed. If you trust in the Lord, your heart is fixed. Psalms 112 and verse 7, it says, you shall not be afraid of the bad news because your heart is established trusting in the Lord. Can you have a heart like that? My heart is established trusting in the Lord. Everything means, I mean, anything means to me is the Lord. Lord, I trust in you. I trust in you. My heart is established in trusting you. That's my character. That's a beautiful scripture. I love that scripture. And I always remember and put before my eyes and I say, Lord, I shall not be afraid of evil tidings. My heart is fixed trusting in the Lord. My heart is fixed trusting in the Lord. Who is the Lord? He's your healer. He's your physician. He's your medication. He's your provider. He's your protection. He's your shield. My heart is fixed trusting in the Lord. Father, we thank you for these words of life that you minister unto us, that we choose to refuse and we choose to believe and receive from you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's partake in the covenant meal.
praise your holy name. Oh God, we thank you. Jesus died for us. He gave his body. His blood was shed on the cross. He was wounded. He was broken. He was beaten. A crown of thorns was put upon his head. Many things happened to him that we could feel sorry for him about. But he said, weep not for your, weep not for me, he said, but weep for your children. What did he mean? Because there is a generational blessing. When we understand the, re- the cross, the rejection of man, of Jesus dying for us, made a generational blessing come upon our lives. So we are so thankful to him and we remember his death. Through his death, we can be redeemed, forgiven, made new creations, walk in health. He became all in all for us so that we could receive everything that he has for us. This is a blood covenant that he made with us on the cross. Father, we thank you for the grace of God and the love of God and the goodness of God and the mercies of God. Lord, through the cross we see your compassion that fails not. Through your compassion, Lord, you have made us new creations for us to walk in the newness of life. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us strong and healthy. And Lord, we apply the blood, even as Moses applied the blood. The death angel carried the disease of killing every male child, the firstborn, But it never happened because Moses obeyed you and applied the blood upon the doorposts. And today, Lord, we apply the blood. Through our confession, we desire and we pray and we believe that you are our protection and by the stripes of Jesus, we are made whole. We thank you, Lord. And no evil shall befall us, neither any plague come nigh our dwelling. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh us. Lord, we thank you for the great rewards that you have for us as we walk by faith. We refuse to walk in fear, and we walk by faith and enjoy the blessing that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake together. Thank you, Father. Praise your glorious name. Praise your mighty name. Bless your glorious name. Thank you, Father, for healing us from the head to the tip of our toe, Lord. Thank you for your protection, the blood protection that we have. As Moses applied on the low post, we have it as a confession that comes out of our mouth that we overcome the devil by the word of our testimony. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And the testimony that we have is a witness of the written word which says that by the stripes of Jesus I am healed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise your glorious name. Bless your mighty name. Bless your holy name. It's far better to be in the presence of the Lord than to be among people who put fear into your mind. You've got to refuse fear. Walk in the blessings by hearing the voice of faith. Let's honor him with our tithes and our offerings and come before him and believe God who supplies all your needs according to his riches in glory according to his riches in glory. So as a seed, we bring our tithes and our offerings and the blessing of the Lord continues in your life. Amen. The anointing inside of us destroys every burden. I'm going to confess it through this song. It says, oh, the word says, I'm anointed. Hallelujah. Oh, the word says, I'm anointed, so I am. So I am, I got that bird moving, the oak destroying power of God in my life. Oh, it says I'm anointed, so I am. Oh, the 
Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Truly we are a powerhouse. Wherever you go, you have the power of God in you and you're a powerhouse. Don't be afraid. Don't walk in fear, walk in faith. Father, we thank and praise you for this blessed afternoon. We thank you for the words of life. We thank you for each and every one of God. They have honored you with their tithes and their offerings, Lord, that you will honor them in their workplaces amongst their neighborhood. And Lord, whatever their needs are, Father, that you will provide for them. And Lord, whatever their wants are, you will meet them, O God, because you said you are the good shepherd who walks before them and they shall not want. And according to your word, O God, that your blessing continues and they shall stay under open heavens. Wherever they go, the heavens are open for them. They can be blessed in whatever situation they are in, O Father, financially, uh, materially, and socially and more moreover Lord spiritually and physically and mentally Lord it's your blessing that continues in each and every one of these dear lives of God that they will have over and above of Father to give to every good work in Jesus name Amen Amen always remember you're a powerhouse you can do all things through Christ Jesus don't be afraid walk no more in fear but walk in faith God bless you